can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. Well, they were to try and channel it for the middle of the day. Free and uncorrupted communication. No young kid growing up ever dreams of someday becoming a businessman. He wants to be a fireman, a sponsored athlete, or a forest ranger. The Lee Iacocas, Donald Trumps, and Jack Welches of the business world are heroes to no one except other businessmen with similar values. I wanted to be a fur trapper when I grew up. So, you know, that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, the kind of odyssey of wanting to be a fur trapper to becoming a garmento. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was born in a little French Canadian town in Maine and uh, when I was seven years old um, my, the whole family the six of us got into a, our automobile with everything we owned and moved to Burbank, California and uh, I couldn't speak English and uh, I was put in school right away because it was the law and uh, I stayed in school for about three days and I ran away from school and uh, so I, uh, when, I, when I was young I could play baseball and, and you know throw a football as well as anybody but when it came time to doing an actual game I always fumbled the ball and I soon learned that uh, team sports and stuff was not my thing. And I spent, you know, my early childhood in the hills above Griffith Park there in San Fernando Valley and uh, high school days hopping freights around the country. Um, so I've kind of taken a different path and, uh, you know, spent a lot of days in, in uh, jails. <laughs> But, you know, in, in those days, it was illegal not to have a, a job. It was, it was called wandering about aimlessly with no apparent means of support. <laughs> and it was a crime. So anyway, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes about entrepreneurs is if, if you want to understand the entrepreneur, study the juvenile delinquent. Because, you know, they're saying, you know, this sucks. <laughs> And I'm going to do it my own way. So uh, when I was about 12 or so, I got in with a bunch of um, falconers in the San Fernando Valley, some, some older men who didn't mind taking in a bunch of young guys and teaching them falconry. And one of the first lessons I learned that kind of carried with me the whole, my whole life. I've, I've been kind of a, a student of Zen philosophy, you know, not religion or anything, just philosophy most of my life. And, you know, when a 12-year-old kid has to go out and trap a, a wild goshawk and then put him on his fists and hold him on there with Jesse's and the, the hawk baits off over and over again, you put him back on and you stay up with him all night until he finally falls asleep, you know, on your fist early in the morning. And that's a real quick way of building trust. Well, you know, the Zen master would have to ask, you know, who's getting trained here? <laughs> um, well, climbing the, the hawk's nest kind of led to climbing for its own sake. And when I was 16 years old, I drove my old uh, 40 Ford that I overhauled an auto shop class to Wyoming and I climbed Gannett Peak, the highest peak in my, Wyoming. That was the first mountain I climbed and I got pretty hooked. And I spent the summer in Jackson Hole and kind of learned to, learned to rock climb. And um, 
In those days, you know, I mean, you're climbing with Converse tennis shoes and, uh, and my first rope I stole from the telephone company. <laughs> it was an old manila rope, you know. But um, the, the, the pitons in those days, you know those spikes you drive in the cracks, were made in Europe and they were made out of soft steel and they were meant to be used just once. <clears throat> you know, the Europeans' attitude was to conquer the, you conquer mountains, you know, like, you know, the conquest of Everest, this kind of stuff. And they felt like, well, you do a first descent of a route and you leave all the pitons in place and it makes it easier for the second uh, group. Well, you know, we were kind of brought up with uh, reading John Muir and, and uh, Thoreau and Emerson and and we had an attitude that you go into the mountains, but you don't leave any trace of having been there. So when I was, uh, I guess, about 18 or something, I went out and I bought myself a forge and an anvil and some hammers and a book on blacksmithing. I taught myself how to blacksmith, and I started making pitons out of hard steel, uh, just bar stock out of hard steel. And I uh, made them for myself, and then they worked so good because you could put them in and take them out repeatedly. And, uh, and then I made some for friends that I was climbing with and then friends of friends wanted some. So then I started selling them. I could make two an hour and I started selling them for a dollar and a half each. Um, doesn't sound like much money, but uh, you got to remember that piton, the European pitons were selling for uh, 15 cents each, so it was 10 times the price. But by that time, we were doing uh, kind of state-of-the-art rock climbs, and you had to have my pitons if you wanted to do those climbs. You couldn't get up those climbs. And pretty soon, you know, we're starting to do uh, multi-day climbs on big walls in Yosemite, like El Capitan, where you know, you spend 10 days up there and you couldn't possibly carry enough pitons um, to do the climb. So we just carry like 40 or so pitons and use them over and over again. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm selling these things out of the back of my car and uh, I'm working uh, in, my shop was in Burbank and but I was surfing already at that time. I started surfing in 1955, I think, in Malibu. And, uh, and I'd uh, I had everything portable, so I'd, uh, I'd go down to, the, down to the beach, like county line and stuff, and I'd carry my 138-pound anvil down to the beach. <laughs> and I'd work, on, <laughs> I'd work on the beach and get hot and sweaty, and I'd go in and surf. And, you know, in those days, you were wishing people would come by and go surfing with you, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> so uh, anyway, you know, I, I never ever wanted to be a businessman because those are the days when, you know, you thought businessmen were grease balls and that was the last thing you wanted to be. But I just happened to be a craftsman that uh, every time I came back from the mountains, I had a more ideas for how to improve various equipments. And, you know, I don't consider myself an inventor at all. I'm, I'm an innovator. And I, could, I look at any, any piece of industrial design or something, and I, I, I just happen to see ways of how to make it better. So that's how I kind of got um, trapped into being a businessman. I, uh, the problem was, I wasn't making any money doing this because I was just too idealistic. I mean, it, I'd spend thousands of dollars in making some tooling and dyes and stuff like that that you're supposed to amortize over three years, and in three months I'd have a new idea on how to improve it. So I was, you know, kind of knocking myself off. <laughs> but you can't make any money doing that. And, uh, but on a climbing trip to Scotland, uh, in the winter, and I think 
must have been about mid 60s. I bought myself a rugby shirt, and I thought, oh, this would make a great uh, climbing shirt because I had a you know really tough material. It had a collar. You know, in those days, we used to love off with cracks. I mean, nobody does off with cracks anymore. <laughs> but it's kind of, it really shreds your clothes and stuff. Anyway, it had a collar so the gear slings wouldn't cut into your neck. And, uh, and, and so I, and it was real colorful. It had, you know, it was blue and yellow and red. And in those days, you know, active sportswear for men was gray, uh, sweatpants and sweatshirts. That was it. Men did not wear colorful clothes. So I started wearing this and climbing, and then all my friends are going, wow, where'd you get that? That's really a great looking shirt. <laughs> so, you know, being a natural entrepreneur, the lights came on, and I started importing a few, and sure enough, they sold like crazy. And then, uh, you know, one of my early products was a pair of shorts. I had an idea for a really tough pair of shorts, double seated, and uh, and so I made the pattern, and uh, and uh, my Korean friend Young Sun Sun Woo, who's, in fact she's sitting right here, uh, did the sewing, and I, I, we made them out of a chair duck, you know, canvas duck that was so heavy. She had to use a walking foot machine that you use for, you know, sewing quarter inch thick leather. And anyway, she sewed them up and, and she put them down on the table and they stood straight up. <laughs> and she was laughing and... So anyway, that was the beginning of our stand-up shorts. They were... You might say they were hand-forged shorts. <laughs> uh, Anyway, I got into making more and more clothing for climbing, and uh, business was taking off. And uh, but it really took off when um, I saw my friend Doug Tompkins, who started a spree, and uh, he was wearing a Fila wool sweater, but it was brushed and it was real fuzzy. And I thought, wow, that thing would make a great uh, thing for, you know, climbing and stuff, if it was made out of synthetic, that would um, dry a lot more quickly. So my wife uh, went down to the Calmart in L.A., where the, it's the, the garment area, and she looked around and found some fake fur, and, uh, you know, the kind of, and she bought some, it was the, the stuff that you use for, uh, you know, in Kansas for covering your toilet seats. <laughs> Real chic stuff. <laughs> so, we made up a jacket, and sure enough, you know, you could fall into a river in, in the winter and uh, take the thing off and shake it, and all the water would come out, and you put it back on, it would save your life. Well, that pile jacket evolved into cinchilla, which was a much more sophisticated version. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, the sales just took off like crazy because um, uh, up till then, I was selling stuff strictly to climbers and hardcore dirt bags. And, <laughs> and now you got all these, uh, these, you know, New Yorkers buying this thing to wear in their gold edition Jeep Cherokee to drive to their Connecticut home. <laughs> So, uh, so kind of in the mid '80s, we're, we're growing the business 40, 50 percent a year. It was just taken off, and uh, and so I, uh, you know, we, we were growing the business by all the traditional ways. We were opening new dealers, wholesale accounts, and we were uh, buying mailing lists for people who didn't request the catalog, but we'd send them one anyway. We opened up uh, our own retail stores, and it was just going, you know, lickety split. And in uh, in 1989, we had ramped up to do another 50% increase in business, and 
We had bought all the inventory and hired tons of people. And in 1990, a recession hit, and instead of growing 50%, we only grew 20. But we were so strung out by growing that quickly every year that we had no cash reserves. And at the same time, our bank was going belly up itself and wouldn't give us any more money. Um, my accountant introduced me to the mafia, <laughs> who wanted 28% interest. Um, I mean, that's how desperate we were. Um, almost lost the business, but, uh, and I had to lay off 20% of our workforce, and, uh, which is the worst thing I've ever had to go through in my life, because, you know, a lot of these people were friends, and, uh, and it was absolutely my fault, and, uh, I swore I'd never, ever want to be in that situation again, but we had to do it to save the company. And um, I realized that my company was, was, uh, had become part of the problem. I was completely unsustainable. And uh, I was doing everything, you know, the way you're supposed to in America, you know, grow like crazy. and. Uh, so I took 10 of uh, the top people in the company, and we all, even though we could, could hardly afford it, we all went down to the real Patagonia down in Argentina, and we walked around in the wilderness for, we had a walkabout for about a week or 10 days, and would walk for uh, you know half an hour, and then we'd all sit down in a circle in a really nice place, and then would say, okay, you know, why are we in business anyway? I mean, none of us ever wanted to be in business. In business. Not, not one had a business degree. And we were all there for, you know, completely different reasons than your normal business. And so we had to communicate what that was. And uh, so we started writing down what our values were. And uh, you know one of the one of the important things is that we wanted to make a really uh, the best quality product. I mean, we're, we were coming from um, a background of making life-saving equipment, making the best climbing equipment in the world, and we wanted to do the same thing with clothing. It was really important that we were a product-driven company, and that. You know, our product was not stock, our product was not the company that was going to be sold someday, but our product was these tools and this clothing. And it was, you know, we're going to put that in the front of the wedge and the whole rest of the company was going to follow the product. So that was really important for us. We didn't want to compromise on that. And then secondly, it, but, you know, uh, um, my chief designer at the time uh, said, you know, we can't make the best, we can make the best uh, quality climbing hardware, but we can't make the best clothes. I said, well, why not? Because, well, you know, the best shirt is a, you know, Giorgio Armani hand-woven uh, Italian fabric and the buttons are hand-sewn and it's, I mean, it's an impeccable thing. It's a work of art and it, it costs 300 dollars minimum if we started making stuff like that would be out of business well I said uh, what happens if you throw that in a washing machine oh well, you can't do that it's got to be dry clean I mean it'll shrink it'll fall apart I mean well, I said that's not very good quality <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know Part of this book is defining what we mean by quality when in clothing. We had to figure out what is quality and what is quality for our customers and for ourselves, because we were our own customers. Then the next thing we wanted was flex time. You know, we wanted to be able to take off a month or two and go on an expedition and do that, you know, two, three times a year or more. <laughs> 
So that's that's the name of the book. Uh, you know, that's that's where I got the name for the book because we've had a company policy that, you know, one of the lessons of surfing or powder skiing or any of those kind of sports is that you don't get you don't go surfing next Tuesday at two o'clock because you may show up there and it's flat or blown out and you're a loser. <laughs> So, you know, we have a company policy that when the surf comes up, everybody drops their work that, that is a serious surfer and they go surfing. <laughs> you just got to be careful you don't have 100% of your employees surfers. <laughs> so, you know, so <clears throat> that means you got to hire very responsible people and then let them get their work done whenever they feel like, you know, <laughs> as long as it doesn't impact other people and, and the work gets done. I don't care when they work. Um, the next thing is we wanted to blur the distinction between work, play, and family. You know, most people drag their asses to work and, and they can hardly wait for the weekend and be with their family and, and do their sports and stuff. So we wanted to blur that whole distinction and, in fact, you know, for a while there we were having uh, uh, young mothers come to work with, the, you know, the baby and newborn baby and the babies in a box on their desk, <laughs> cardboard box. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't want to leave our family and disappear for eight hours a day. And plus I had, a, you know, I've always had a very high percentage of women working at Patagonia. We probably have, I think, 79% or something right now. And they're in high-level positions and didn't want to lose them when they got pregnant. So, you know, my wife started a child care center, on-site child care center, which is uh, one of the first ones ever in America. So the other, the other thing is we wanted to be surrounded by friends. So we wanted to hire friends, friends of friends, and we wanted to hire passionate outdoor people or people who had a passion for something. <clears throat> you, know, you know, the high school kid that sits there and watches television for six hours a day with a kind of a drool coming out the side of his mouth and, and uh, you know, their brain is more dead than when they're sleeping. You know, there's no hope for those kind of people. I'd much rather get a young criminal or something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we wanted to be surrounded by friends. And so we wanted to hire these kind of people and then teach them business rather than hire business people and then uh, try to instill a passion for the outdoors so at the same time, I kind of, when I came back, I, I started writing a philosophy of business from those values. And that's what this book is about. It's a philosophical book on different aspects of business. And I, I read about 50 books on, I I, you know, I woke up one day and I realized, okay, I am a businessman. And it looks like this is going to be my life's work. I better figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> so I went out and read about 50 books on business, a lot of books on Japanese management style, which is totally different than the US. I figured they had a lot to teach us. Um, Scandinavian style of management, I mean, all kinds of stuff, just to educate myself, because I knew that we couldn't do it the usual way, and that um, plus, for me, the, the only enjoyable part of business, or the most enjoyable part of the business, since I'm kind of a contrarian, is breaking the rules and then making it work. I mean, that's why it's taken me 15 years to write this book, because I, you know, I didn't want to write a book and then go out of business, <laughs> go bankrupt right away. <laughs> I had to make sure it works. <laughs> uh, and so then I, I took, I took uh, 15 people at a time, and we spent a week or five days 
uh, going to different areas up in the hills and the Los Padres and stuff and doing the same thing. Instead of talking about our values, we started talking about a philosophy of business. And I was teaching everybody in the company these, you know, these philosophies. And I didn't trust anybody else to do it. I figured it just had to come from me. I didn't want it diluted. <clears throat> and uh, I did that with every single person in the company. Now, you know, we have over a thousand employees worldwide, and that's one reason why I wrote this book. I, <laughs> I'm getting burned out on this stuff. Um, well, that, you know, when, uh, when I was saying that we had become unsustainable, about the same time, I started seeing a lot more uh, devastation of the natural world. Uh, I travel around in, in Africa where I'd been there 10 or 20 years before and I started seeing how, how badly things were going. And uh, in this country, you know, you go try to fish a stream that used to have lots of fish and now is, is a dead, it was just a sewer. And uh, I got, uh, I got, I started thinking about a different, another part to our mission statement. Our original mission statement was make the best quality product. And we always felt that uh, something is perfected, not when you can't add anything more to it, but when you can't take anything away. You know, it's kind of a difference between an old-fashioned Cadillac that was so butt ugly that they had to put all kinds of chrome breasts on it and stuff, you know, to, compared to a Ferrari in those days, it didn't have any chrome on it. I mean, it's just as beautiful lines. And uh, so that's always been our philosophy. But then, you know, I thought we needed another part to our mission statement because really getting concerned about the natural world and I was very concerned about never having a company that was unsustainable again. So we added in uh, the second part which says cause no unnecessary harm. And it doesn't say cause no harm because you know there's no way you can ever manufacture a product without causing harm. And according to the you know, second law of thermodynamics, entropy you basically end up with probably more waste than, than you end up in the, with in the final product. <clears throat> there's, you know, there's no such thing as sustainability. There's a beginning and end to everything, as any Buddhist will tell you. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the only sustainability that I know of, the only thing that comes close to sustainability is probably hunting and gathering on a very small scale. The only economic activity is probably, you know, organically grown uh, agriculture. Because, you know, the energy comes from the sun and the sun is free, but everything else causes an incredible amount of waste and pollution. But, uh, you know, climbing in, climbing in Yosemite taught me an important lesson, another Zen lesson, that what's important is not the end goal, you know, like in Zen archery, you don't focus on the target. You, you spend years in learning how to do all the different movements and shooting an arrow until finally you perfect all the movements and then you, you can hit the bullseye with your eyes closed. But, um, and you know, climbing in Yosemite, you do a 10-day climb on El Capitan and you get to the top and guess what? There's nothing there. <laughs> it's just flat up there. And, so, you know, what's important is how you climb. And uh, if you compromise the process, um, you know, I, I think compromise is the work of the devil. You know, it's somehow we've, in government particularly, they love compromise. You know, and compromise is, you know, Solomon cutting the baby in half and giving half a baby to each mother who's warring over whose baby it was. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I don't know how I got carried away on that one. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I always, I always felt that uh, a responsible farmer, you know, leaves the, the land in better shape than when he received it. The forester doesn't just clear cut and then plant a mono crop, but takes just what's needed and to keep the forest healthy and then um, leaves trees for the next generation. And then a responsible government makes its decisions on the, the society being here at least, you know, seven generations into the future instead of one or two years. But somehow business is exempt from that responsibility. You know, American style of business is you're supposed to grow this business as fast as you possibly can. You don't have to make a profit, you just show lots of growth so that you can have an IPO, sell a bunch of stock to some suckers, and then, you know, you, you uh, retire to seize your world and play golf the rest of your life. <laughs> well, um, I don't believe that is, is right. And I always felt that if uh, the, the farmer has this responsibility, well, so do I as a owner of a company. And so we decided to put our company in a path to where we would be here 100 years from now. So all the decisions made are for the long term. And uh, so, which means, you know, we can't grow 15% a year. Because uh, one time at an all company meeting, I started putting a one and a bunch of zeros on butcher paper all around the room. And I said, this is how big we're gonna be if we continue growing at, you know, 40% a year for the next 40 years. You know, it was, it was a bazillion dollars. I mean, it was so ridiculous, you can't believe it. And so we've, uh, we, we decided to grow at a natural growth. And so natural growth means that uh, when the customer tells you that uh, you're, they're frustrated in, in buying your stuff, that you, your catalog, they just got the catalog and you're already sold out, that you just you need to make more. But we don't advertise on inner city buses to try to get gang kids to, write, to buy our, our black down jackets instead of Timberland or North Face. Um, the reason we got into trouble in the first place is that with this cinchilla, we were selling stuff to people who wanted it but didn't need it. Whenever you're in that situation, you're a victim of the economy. The economy is going to go up and down, and you're going to go up and down like a yo-yo. And particularly if you really follow the fashion trends, and then you're really um, in a scary situation. So. Uh, we made a lot of decisions then to try to be here 100 years from now. And from then on, uh, we, we controlled our growth and we put ourselves, uh, I mean, you could call it a path towards sustainability. It's the process towards sustainability that counts. And, uh, and we also accepted the fact that you can't have it all. And, you know, very few businesses will accept that. I mean, we, we turn away business all the time. I mean, our, you know, we aver our advertising budget is one half of 1% of sales, which is nothing in, in our kind of business. Um, we want people to come to us. We want to have loyal customers who tell their friends. And then, you know, if we grow 3%, 4% a year, we can be very profitable at that, and that's fine. Um, you know, I could call Nordstrom tomorrow and probably get, you know, $5 million order out of them or something like that. But that would put us on a suicide course. I've always believed that there's a proper size for any endeavor. And, uh, and I think there's a proper size for my company. Um, you know, the... I use kind of a metaphor to, to show uh, for what we were trying to do, which is make the best 
product and stuff. Um, imagine a little French restaurant that spends 10 years in getting their first Michelin star, another 10 years to get their second, and then, you know, 25 years they've been in business, they finally get their third Michelin star, and they're one of the 10 best restaurants in the world. And then they say, okay, we made it, so now let's put in 50 tables. Well, there are no three-star French restaurants with 50 tables. It's impossible. In Japan, there's some little, the very best restaurants in Japan, like in Kyoto, they're, it, it costs you $450, $500 to eat there. Um, the size is dictated by the fact that the chef is the owner because um, you, you can't hire a, a chef. Only, only the owner has the passion to really uh, have one of these great restaurants. And the size of the restaurant has to be so that the chef is cooking and is waiting on the customer at the same time. So he has to see his customers right there. So they're tiny, they're very small. So uh, for what we want to do, for our values, we can't have a large company. You know, we have to start hiring more and more MBAs, and, um, which we don't want to do. <clears throat> um, anyway, we got out of the crisis. And we've been doing pretty well ever since. In fact, uh, the other value that we wanted to have was to get out of debt. I didn't want to ever deal with bankers again. And uh, we're pretty close to that right now. But um, one of the, the last philosophy that I kind of wrote uh, was fairly recently, and it's the, the, our environmental philosophy. And I think it applies to, uh, to a business or to individuals. You can think of it as, you know, as something that you could do yourself because, um, you know, if, if you're an alcoholic, you have to confront yourself and say, you know, I am an alcoholic before anything happens to stop drinking. I mean, and, you know, we, we just uh, admit that we're polluters. We're, we're using up non-renewable resources and we're making, uh, you know, consumer products, and we're part of the problem. So we're trying to be on the process of minimizing the damage that we do, and we have a five-step program for doing that. Um, you know, the number one is to lead and examine life. I think most of the damage caused uh, to the environment and to nature is caused unintentionally, and it's just from all of us just blundering along, not questioning what we do. It's, uh, it's you know, if you want to feed your family healthy food, you got to know where it comes from, right? You can't just go to the supermarket and buy vegetables. I mean, you know, the, the tomatoes might come from Mexico where they still use DDT or we're still using all kinds of different pesticides on our vegetables here. So you got to know, you got, sometimes you got to know the farmer or you got to... So it's the same thing with uh, if you want to kind of clean up your act, you got to lead and examine life. And for us in the clothing business, this means uh, asking a lot of questions. There's uh, Toyota. Uh, has a management um, kind of uh, a management technique that they use to uh, solve problems. You know, if if the gov if our government uses this technique, you'd see a big difference. But you know, they say government is not interested in solving problems; it just rearranges them. And <laughs> but so okay, so we. We started an environmental assessment program, and we hired some people to start asking these questions. So one of the first questions we ask is, of all the fibers used in making clothing, which are the most damaging and which are the least damaging? Well, there's no books on this stuff, and it takes a long time to find some answers. But finally, we find out 
that of all the fibers, you know, I mean, at first we thought, oh, it's got to be synthetics and stuff. It's, it's, I mean, they were made out of petroleum and stuff. But we find out that the most damaging fiber by far is 100% pure cotton. You know, those beautiful little cotton balls on baby skins you see in ads? That's the worst. In fact, it probably uses more petroleum than making synthetics. Um, because, you know, all our agriculture uses petroleum. I, I have a fact in the book here that I got out of National Geographic. It takes eight barrels of petroleum to produce one cow. <laughs> so anyway, the reason in industrially grown cotton is so bad is that it uses 25% of the world's pesticides and insecticides and it only occupies 3% of the world's farmland. And, uh, and some of these chemicals are so toxic that they cost $500 a gallon. And in some areas of the world, they spray the fields as much as 20 times in a season. So I, I took a little trip to the Central Valley, in San Joaquin Valley here, and went to some cotton fields. And boy, it was an education. It was a real eye-opener. It was, I mean, they're killing fields. There's nothing out there that's alive. It's just, uh, there's no birds, there's no insects, there's no weeds. There's just these little canals of toxic water. Um, and, you know, the cancer rate's 10 times normal. There's crop dusters flying over, right over the workers, doesn't matter. And, uh, and, and there's no outlet to that San Joaquin Valley. There's no river that goes to the ocean. So all of that flows out into low areas and creates these huge ponds, like Kesterson. You've probably heard of that. And then they hire these, these guys to sit on lawn chairs with shotguns and keep the waterfowl from landing so that, uh, you know, they don't have uh, chicks with three beaks and four legs and stuff like that. And I, I came back and I said, okay, <laughs> I don't want to be in business. I, I didn't want to be in business in the first place, but I really don't want to be in business <laughs> if I have to use industrially grown cotton. And, you know, cotton was 20% of our sales. And I said, I don't care. We're, we're just, I'm not going to do this. It's kind of like, you know, you have a company, you're one of the best employers in America, you're hiring people and you're giving them great benefits, and, but you're making landmines. But you're making great landmines, you know, the highest quality landmines. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, go to Cambodia and you see all these people walking around with one arm and one leg and you see the results of your landmines. And, and uh, so I, you know, so I gave the company two years to get out of uh, making anything out of industrially grown cotton. And uh, you don't, you don't just uh, call your fabric supplier and say, oh, you know, that 10,000 yards of shirting I ordered last week, you know, switch that to organically grown. <laughs> A few companies had tried using organic cotton. Esprit tried it. Vanity Fair tried it. But what they did is they tried a little separate line and, and they figured out, well, you know, if this takes off, then we'll grow it, and if it doesn't, you know, we'll just, we got our regular business going. So they weren't really committed like I was. I just told the company, that's it. Either we make this work, or we're never going to use cotton again. And so it mobilized the entire company, and I've never seen the company do better work. And they were all, you know, everybody went to the Central Valley, they all saw this, they came back, they were all absolutely committed. And, um, you know, we, we started talking to organic farmers and uh, sometimes co-signing their loans so that they could get a loan from the bank because the bank wouldn't loan them any money if they grew organically. We, uh, we had to go to the, find a gin that would process our cotton because, you know, the gin separates the seed from the cotton ball. And these gins are just dripping with cotton seed oil. And, you know, the oil is where all the chemicals are concentrated. You know, one of the chemicals is, uh, is uh, Agent Orange, because they use that to defoliate the plants before, so the mechanical pickers can pick. 
Well, anyway, cottonseed oil is not regulated by the FDA. Somehow they've got it so that they don't have to worry about that. And, uh, you know, they check out your chips someday. If there's any cottonseed oil in there, don't eat it. And then they feed the cotton seeds after they press the oil out to the cattle. So you're getting that in your beef. Anyway, um, we can't run. <laughs> we, can't <laughs> we can't very well run our organic cotton through this gin without convincing the guy to clean it first. And then we get to the spinner who makes the, the yarn and stuff, and makes the fiber, and he doesn't want to deal with us because our stuff is coming in with, you know, s seeds and stems and sticks and, you know, little pieces of leaves and because we didn't use defoliant. The, the, the farmer had to do it uh, in a natural way, kind of starve the plant for water at just at the right time of the year and stuff. So I can tell you that it wasn't easy switching over, but we did it. We found a few good partners and we convinced them that this was uh, going to be the future <clears throat> and we made it work. And. Uh, But, you know, that's only one question. We're supposed to ask five questions. So then we said, okay, well, what are we going to do? How about the dyes that are dying, that you use for dyeing cotton? I mean, we never had to worry about this. Cause we, we just ordered, we'd just call a fabric supplier, and he'd come with a big book, and we'd look at all these different prints and fabrics and say, oh, yeah, give me this, give me that. So, you know, how about dyes? We, so he called you know, try to find out if these dyes are toxic. Well, nobody wants to tell you. Nobody even knows. They never even, the people making the dyes haven't even asked the question. Well, finally we find out, yeah, this stuff's toxic. And, but there's a company in West Germany that makes cotton dyes that are non-toxic, except, you know, one color is toxic. So, okay, so we don't do that color. Okay, that's two questions. Well, <clears throat> where are they going to dye this stuff? You know, is there a big outfall going into a river from the dye house? So we send somebody over to Portugal because we're going to make flannel shirts out of, out of them. So they go there and they, sure enough, here's all these dye house on, on, the, on this river that goes into Porto in Portugal. Huge river. Big outfall pipes going right into the river. But the last dye house down at the mouth of the river can't use the water because it's jet black. So they've bought all this uh, fancy machinery to clean the water so they can use it. So they, they clean it and then they dye their stuff and then they run it back through the machinery again and it comes out pure into the river. So there you go. Now we got a choice. You know, education leaves you choices. You know, the un uneducated choices. He's, he's got to go through life like this. So anyway, um, so, so then, uh, you know, one more question. Well, what's going to happen to uh, th this cotton clothing when the customer is all done with it? I mean, we should be responsible for that product all the way from birth till death and beyond. Uh, you know, I feel a company should be responsible not only for the product, but for how the product is made. And uh, so, you know, cotton, when you're done with it, uh, you know, if you bought a pair of uh, bell-bottom pants and suddenly they're out of fashion, you throw them away, right? Or you t give them the Salvation Army and then 15 years later it comes back in the fashion and people are rushing to buy them again, but um, so that was a problem. So we were absolutely committed to not putting fashion into our sportswear. You know, if the collar points are five inches long, well, we don't make them five inches. We do them three inches so that they're never in fashion, never out of fashion. <laughs> and 
you know, like, you know, the difference between a Hawaiian shirt that you can buy at a vintage Hawaiian shirt store for $300 and one that's 50 cents at the Salvation Army, they're both Hawaiian shirts. But, you know, one is classic. One never goes out of style, you know, and uh, the patterns line up and uh, there's a big difference between the two. So we realized that the most important thing we could do is to try to make the clothes last as long as possible and, uh, and not go in and out of fashion because, uh, because we're responsible for them. But I can tell you uh, one, one thing that's just happened very recently that uh, is really exciting. It's the most exciting thing that's happened in the company in a long time. We've partnered with a with a uh, Japanese mill that just spent $100 million in a recycling plant where they're going to recycle polyester. Now, we've been making 40 different products out of, you know, all our fleece and stuff made out of recycled soda pop bottles. But when you're done with those products and they're all worn out, you throw them away. But now, we're telling our customers that when you're done with your capillene underwear, which is polyester, you bring it back to us and wash it first, <laughs> especially the thongs. <laughs> um, and then we're, we're going to bundle that stuff up and we're going to send it back to Japan. And, and uh, you know, all the ships going back to Japan are empty anyway. <laughs> so, uh, the shipping rates are really low. We've calculated all, all the energy usage, and it's going to go to this plant, and they're going to melt this stuff down and take it to its original polymer and then make fiber, and then we're going to make more underwear out of it. So we're going to complete the circle, what Bill McDonough calls cradle to cradle. And it's never been done with clothing. And we're starting with our Kaplan underwear, and we're going to be uh, eventually doing it with all our polyester and now you know I'm we just designed a pair of surf trunks that instead of nylon it's polyester with a view towards you know a couple years from now we'll be able to do the same thing with that we're making one shell that's all polyester and we're working with a, a another factory that's uh, that's gonna do the same thing with nylon six so you know we're used to recycling aluminum cans and uh, making more aluminum cans. When you buy an automobile, 95% of the steel in that automobile comes from another automobile. And uh, so now we're going to do it with clothing. And, you know, right now, probably the most, the least damaging clothes you can buy or fiber that you can make clothes out of is probably hemp. Um, but I can see that soon uh, it'll probably be polyester and nylon six because in the process we only lose 5% of the material and it only takes 20% of the energy to make a new product from the old product than, than if you made a petroleum. So anyway, <laughs> I hope we're not all wearing these red leisure polyester suits someday, but. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, the second part is, you know, of my f five steps is to clean up your act. After you educate yourself, then act on it. And then the third part is, you know, we're always going to be polluters and, and, then, and we're always going to be consumers. You know, we're not citizens anymore, we're consumers. You know, it's not, it's not the government that wants to, or oil companies that want to drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, it's us. We're the ones. And uh, so we're never going to be perfect, so we've got to do some penance. So that's where we take 1% uh, of our sales. It's, it's not 1% of profits. It's 1% of our total sales. And we give that away to organizations that are doing some good. Um, since well, the mid-80s, we've given away about $22 million. And what we do is... Uh,
Well, that's, that's a lot of your monies. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what we do with it is, is we give it away to environmental causes. And people ask us why we don't give to social causes. Well, I think if you start asking the five questions with any cause, any, with any problem in the world, you'll get down to the real causes and environmental cause. You know, whether it's this hurricane in, in New Orleans or it's poverty in Africa and genocide, it's, it's all, if you ask enough questions, it gets down to us destroying our planet. And, you know, and government is not interested in causes. They're interested in working on symptoms. You know, take, you know, one out of eight women in this room are going to get breast cancer. And that's, that's up from one in 40 in World War II. So you can't tell me it's genetics. It has to have some environmental cause. And yet, you know, I found out in writing this book that only 3% of the monies that go to breast cancer research go to trying to find environmental causes of breast cancer. All the rest goes to finding cures. Well, you know, <laughs> um, you know, your average house has 5,000 toxic chemicals, most of which haven't been tested to see if they give you cancer. There's only been like under 1,000 chemicals that have been tested to see if they give you cancer. So you can give money to breast cancer research, but give it to the organizations that are working on stopping the use of these pesticides and these toxic chemicals. So, you know, of the powerful forces in our society, whether it's federal government, and, uh, state government, local governments, there's one that's more powerful than any of them, and that's civil democracy. And that's, that's who we give our money to. These, you know, 30,000 uh, activist organizations working on environmental causes in America. Uh, you know, think, think about how this country was started. You know, a bunch of activists dumped some tea in Boston Harbor. Um, you know, people say, well, you know, Lincoln freed the slaves. Well, you know, Lincoln just wanted to keep the Union together, really. The slaves were being encouraged to flee the South through the Underground Railroad, funded by Northern philanthropists, a bunch of activists. You know, civil rights legislation. It wasn't Johnson. You know, it was uh, Rosa Parks, you know, a senior citizen, refused to get off a bus. And little black kids refused to go to segregated schools. Women's suffrage. Vietnam. <laughs> Bunch of activists got us out of that stupid war. So, you know, I really believe in this civil democracy. And in fact, one of the lessons of nature that is really important for me is nature loves diversity. You know, it's always trying to make new species. It hates monoculture. It hates uh, a mono crop. It, it just loves its diversity. And why not, why not solve all our problems with, with hundreds of thousands of little NGOs, non-government organizations around that are doing good work instead of, you know, just bloated bureaucracies and stuff. <clears throat> 